This is an ACU Centre for Liturgy podcast. Speaking of liturgy. Can you name some of the women involved in the liturgical renewal since the 19th century? Speaking of liturgy, Catherine Harmon, award-winning author, pastoral liturgist and co-editor of the influential United States blog site Pray Tell, Worship, Wit and Wisdom, reveals and describes how women were involved in and contributed to the liturgical movement, which sought to renew and shape the Church's liturgy. In the midst of the Paschal Mystery, we see a sparse landscape around the cross. Aside from jeering crowds or faithless disciples who variously betrayed, denied, or fled the scene, just a few strangers seem to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. Yet it's not only the centurion, the good thief, or the beloved disciple standing by Christ Jesus. Mary, his mother, is present. So was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, and, of course, Mary Magdalene, and apparently others as well. There were also many women there. The longer we let our eyes adjust to that paschal landscape, the more readily we recognize the presence of women, emerging as central, not marginalized members of the faithful, following Christ. Women have always been there and continue to serve the life of the Church. Addressing the disappearance of women from the historical narrative has been a challenge which scholars have long been addressing across fields. The area of liturgical studies is the same, and the responsible liturgical historian must be attended to the presence of voices which we have missed out, be it persons of color, children, the marginalized, and in every era. I'd like to focus on a moment in history which has so immediately and profoundly shaped our present experience of the church, the liturgical movement. In short, the liturgical movement refers to a complex series of theological, social, and spiritual forces which converged over the course of the modern period. They came to a particular head in the 19th century in a response to the secularization and industrialization of the European continent. The movement had both academic and pastoral aspects and occurred in numerous Christian denominations. For Roman Catholics, Benedictine monasteries tended to serve as major hubs for the movement's spread, and its iterations took place across the globe, from North and South America to South Africa and Europe to the Australian continent. The liturgical movement is particularly significant for the liturgical present because its emphasis upon active participation, responsibility of the priesthood of the baptized, social action, unification, ecclesiology, the significance of baptism, attention to scripture, the liturgical year, the formative effect of literal practice, just to name a few, definitively shaped the council documents and subsequent liturgical reforms, and explicitly have shaped Pope Francis' liturgical documents especially on liturgical formation. The liturgical movement frames and provides the necessary foundation for contemporary liturgical renewal. Perhaps surprising to recognize, especially when we consider liturgical change in light of texts and ecclesial authorities, which for Romans are male, we do not consider women's role in liturgical renewal. However, with a closer examination of the sources, women are present from the earliest efforts of the liturgical movement. If you're finding yourself saying, but I never see women, I encourage you to look directly at the plethora of academic and pastoral resources which were created by or written by women, and we start to see how women show up in surprisingly prominent ways. For example, the ward of the renowned mid-century publishers Sheed and Ward was actually Maisie Ward. Frank Sheed was her husband. Uh, at the closing session of the Second Vatican Council, the brass candlesticks uh, adorning the altar were designed by invitation by liturgical artist Ade Bethune. And the Advent wreath, which has become ubiquitous as the engaging symbolic activity 
uh, preparing for Christmas at home and in the parish, was introduced to mid-century Catholics by liturgical advocate Therese Mueller. I could spend much more of the day uh, naming various ways in which women's shaping of the liturgical life might surprise us in the present, but I'd like to focus on four key areas for activity in the liturgical movement just in the United States context. The arts, education, social action, and the home. I'll highlight just one person from each area to help us start to see some of the breadth and depth of what's going on for women in the liturgical movement. First, the arts. A consideration of liturgical art cannot be made without looking at liturgical artist and Catholic worker Adi Bethun. Born in Belgium in 1914, Adi Bethun's family immigrated to the U.S. and lived in New York City, where Bethun was encouraged to pursue the arts. In the fall of 1933, Bethune first encountered the Catholic Worker newspaper and noted how terrible its illustrations were. She offered to begin creating pictures, engraving them in wood or linoleum tiles so they could be printed easily. She used the saints of the day, followed the missal, and created pictures of women and men who were busy, active, and working as images of the Christ life. Not only would Bethune's images grace the pages of the Catholic worker, in fact they still do, but her authority and interest in liturgically informed art, the style of which was not clouded by a romantic sensibility or unrealistic images of happy saints with glowing faces, this art was attractive to liturgical movement members who sought to promote active participation on the part of the lay faithful grounded in attention to the liturgical year. Bethune's work eventually expanded to church architecture and liturgical consultancy well beyond the years of the council. Ade Bethune died in Newport, Rhode Island in 2002. A second area of focus is education. Education is absolutely prime for liturgical movement advocates who routinely sought active, intelligent participation in the life of the faith. Religious education took place very prominently in the Catholic parochial school system, which was very much driven by women religious. Among the many, many Catholic sisters involved so prominently in education, just one example comes in the work of Mother Mary Samuel Coughlin, of the Cincinnati, Wisconsin, Dominican community. Born in the U.S. in 1868, her continual advocacy for religious education intersected with the larger work of a liturgical movement. In 1932, she argued that an enthusiastic cooperation on the part of teaching sisters was an essential ingredient for success in the liturgical movement. She offered practical suggestions for how to train children in the schools to both sing and pray the Mass, from musical training and collaboration with music teachers, to access to and instruction on how to use the Missal to participate in the Dialogue Mass, a low Latin Mass which included spoken responses on the part of the lay faithful. Such strategies, music, Missal, Dialogue Mass, would prove to be key aspects of children's formation in the liturgical movement. Mother Coughlin died in 1959. Thirdly, we can consider social action. The liturgical movement was not only a movement for better music or using the missal, as important as those aspects were. Many social action initiatives, often associated under the larger banner of Catholic action, were interested in transforming lives and inviting all the world to Christ. Many of these groups look to liturgical worship as food for formation, be it Eucharist, sacrament, or liturgical prayer. One such group includes the Friendship House Movement, founded by Catherine de Hook Dougherty. Born in Russia in 1896 to an aristocratic family, de Hook fled during the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution for sanctuary in the United States. Seeing a great need, she decided to establish a house as an apostolate ministering to inner-city New York African-American women, children, and men. Her work attracted the attention of liturgical movement advocate 
Virgil Michael. And De Hook described how, in her own work with the marginalized, she saw Christ. She said how, when she took part in the Mass and Communion, it would allow us to, every day, walk about with Christ in our hearts. Her work would continue, moving from New York City to Toronto, Ontario, and Canada. De Hook Dougherty died in 1985 and is now considered a servant of God, one of the stages on the road to beatification. Fourthly, let's consider the home. The final frontier of liturgical movement work is the ground of the Christian life, the family, and the domestic church. Women were considered particular authorities in this area, and from the 1930s, and considerably increasing in the post-World War II era, women reflected upon, developed resources for, and practiced living a liturgical life within the home, with their families and with children. Among the many possible examples of women's contributions in this area, one for us to consider is Mary Reed Newland of Massachusetts in the U.S. Born in 1916, Newland composed one of the most popular texts for use by Christian families, The Year and Our Children, Catholic Family Celebrations for Every Season, written in 1954. In it, she walked through the liturgical year with suggestions for activities and anecdotes of how Newland celebrated feast days in her family. Not only did she include recipes for gingerbread boy apostles, or instructions for how to create a shadow box theater for praying the mysteries of the rosary with children, get an empty cereal box and get, get to work, but she offered commentaries on the Christian life, refining it as a life in Christ and a life experienced in the family. Mary Reed Newland, whose The Year and Our Children is still in print, died in 1989. What I've considered here is just a glimpse of the many contributions made by women. Women who were hardly insignificant or silent in their moments, but have quietly disappeared from our historical narratives. They remind us that liturgical renewal is not experienced in texts or rituals alone, but in how these texts and rituals form and shape our attitudes, our practices and our very hearts, if we're encountering the living God in one another. The work of the lay apostolate is real and active. It is the work of the church. It is the need of the modern world. And there were also many women there, hoping in Christ. That was Catherine Harmon discussing some of the women who helped shape the renewal of the church in the liturgical movement. The ACU Centre for Liturgy, which provides pastoral formation in liturgy across Australia and beyond, is pleased to provide this podcast, Speaking of Liturgy.